Hey, Matt. All right. If I declare a quorum is present, so we'll start. My name's Hank Greeley. I am a professor here at Stanford Law School, and I'm director of Stanford's Center for Law and the Biosciences. In both those capacities, I welcome you to our first lunch event of winter quarter 2018-2019. The Center for Law and Biosciences exists here at the law school to encourage education, research, scholarship, events, free lunches, and all sorts of good things revolving around the intersection of biosciences understood very broadly and the law understood very broadly to include ethical issues, legal issues, social issues. I think we have a perfect topic today uh, where we're going to talk about uh, the use of human genome editing in embryos, uh, particularly through uh, the experiments, uh, the work of uh, Dr. He Zhongkui, who I'm going to refer to as JK from here on, so I don't butcher his name again any worse than I already have. Uh, and uh, we've got some great discussants for this issue. But I want to stress, yes, what's brought this to the, to the top of attention right now has been the announcement from last November about crispr babies. But it's not just about that experiment and that event. It's about where we go from here. So going, it's, it's the He affair and beyond. So before we get to the meat of this, I want to announce we've got a couple of other events. Our Center for Law and Biosciences holds a workshop. It's on Tuesdays this winter quarter at 4.30. We have uh, Andrea Roth from Berkeley talking about forensic DNA, Eric Feldman from Penn talking about regulation of new tobacco and nicotine products, Tim Greeny from the Hastings College of Law, the UC Hastings College of Law talking about concentration in the healthcare industry, and Jamie King also from Hastings talking about state efforts to bring down drug prices. If you are on our mailing list, you'll get several announcements of all of these. If you are not on our mailing list, you should be on our mailing list send an email to clb at law.stanford.edu. Now, back to today. I am very happy that we've got two of my Stanford colleagues who not only have been involved in the issue, but know JK, have talked to JK both before, during, and after uh, the announcement. Um, the plan for today is all three of us will do a little opening statement. Then we'll have some discussion amongst ourselves and with you, and we'll see where we go. One of our speakers is Dr. Matthew Porteous. Matt Porteous is a professor of pediatrics paren stem cell transplantation there you go. at Stanford Medical School, where he got both his MD and his PhD. Matt's roots in the area actually go deeper than that. I, I read your biography, and you and my children are all graduates of Gunn High School here in Palo Alto. Matt has worked at the intersection of stem cells and genetics for quite a while, works on trying to uh, treat or cure genetic diseases by modifying genes. And most relevant for this purpose, he is a member of the organizing committee of the International Summits on Human Gene Editing. The first summit was in December of 2015. The second summit was in late November in 2018 in Hong Kong, and that's where this tornado landed. Our second speaker is Bill Hurlbut, William Hurlbut. Bill Hurlbut has his MD, undergraduate and MD degrees from Stanford. I don't know whether he went to Gunn High School, no. but he does have a close connection with this, well, sort of with this building. His uncle was a professor at Stanford Law School, and not only a professor, he's the professor our teaching award is named after. Despite that, he never went to law school. <laughs> He has an MD, and he also did postdoctoral studies in theology and biomedical ethics. He was a member of the Council on Bioethics from 2000 to 2009 during the administration of George W. Bush. And he also knows JK and has spoken with him before, during, and after the events in question. Um, I'm just a law professor. I don't know JK. I have been working on issues around CRISPR for a long time including being present at a meeting in Napa Valley in January 2015 that in a way kind of kicked off the whole National Academy process that uh, has led to a couple of summits and a couple of reports. So no further ado. Oh, one last thing. This is being video recorded. So if, and we will take questions from the audience, if you don't want 
the universe, at least within the number of light years present, or the light years that the stream will reach, to hear what you have to say. So with no more ado, you want to start with Matt Fortier. Yes. Thank you, Hank, for that kind introduction. Thank you all uh, for attending. And uh, I haven't talked in front of a law school crowd before, but I suspect I don't it's need to. It's a pretty mixed crowd. I'm gonna say, I, but I'm going to say that it's probably not a bunch of shrinking violets, and there's going to be a lot of interesting questions. So in addition to what Hank told you, the other uh, uh, two other things I'd like to say is um, I, my research lab over in the Loki Stem Cell Building is uh, focused on using the CRISPR technology to modify hematopoietic stem cells to cure serious genetic diseases like sickle cell anemia, bubble boy disease, and other diseases. And we're hoping to move uh, this research into clinical trials, into patients uh, in the next year. And we're trying to do it. You know, we are doing it in a way that's above board, transparent, and through all the normal regulatory <laughs> agency. And again, it has nothing to do with the germline. The other point I would like to uh, make, in addition to filling in my CV, is I was also on the National Academy Study Committee that sort of put out a report between the two summits. Um, Valentine's Day 2017. <laughs> it was it? 2017. Uh, yeah. Um, and that uh, committee was international. I um, felt like I was the one who was not like the other in terms of seniority, although um, my expertise around genome editing, I think, gave me a pretty strong voice at the table. And that committee report, which is available online, if you're interested, I can help you find it, um, addressed numerous different issues. But I think one of the most controversial uh, parts of that report is the committee said that, uh, unlike almost anything prior in history, said that there, if certain, certain conditions were met, and there was a list of, let me count, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten conditions were met, that one could imagine that germline or heritable editing would be medically indicated. And, it, and we were critiqued uh, for that as not proposing a moratorium. Um, I'm not going to go through all 10, but I, if you're interested, if you look at the 10, it is a functional moratorium. In the technology as it exists today, the social aspects as it exists today are not met. Uh, so if anyone wished to do heritable editing and follow the recommendations that are in the report, they actually couldn't achieve it. And that then brings us to uh, JK, who um, I first met um, at a uh, small uh, workshop that Bill Hurlbut organized up at Berkeley with Jennifer Doudna. Um, he was invited because um, he had made it known that he was interested in doing uh, CRISPR editing of embryos in mice and non-human primates, and even human embryos. And he presented his uh, data at that, uh, at that workshop in January 2017, um, but with no indication that he was ever planning on implanting these embryos, because in fact, the data didn't support he was getting efficiencies enough to do this. A year later, um, I got an email from him saying that I'm in town and I'm circling the US and would I have time to meet with him? And so uh, I met with him on a Friday uh, around 4 o'clock. Um, and I sat down, and he was with a graduate student who I have no idea uh, who that guy's name is. Um, and JK proceeded to explain the, the progress they've made in making the uh, embryo editing process more efficient, um, some technical details of what they were doing. Um, and then at the conclusion of this data, I said, well, of course, you know, this is still not even technically ready uh, to be moved into anything that you would think of. And at that point, he paused, and he said, well, in fact, I have uh, a IRB approval from my local institution to do embryo editing on embryos generated from a father who is HIV positive and a mother who is HIV negative in order to generate a human being who would, might be resistant to infection by HIV. And at that point, I more or less pulled out um, the criteria and went through them with them and saying, what you're proposing does not meet any of these criteria, and you should not proceed any further. 
And, at the, and I said, and furthermore, you know, I know you have an IRB, and I assumed that the IRB approval that he had gotten from his local institution was valid. I, I didn't question that. Um, and I said, moreover, I think you need to seek broader uh, input from leaders in China in this field before you move forward. And then I ended with, this is a, you know, you're a scientist talking to a scientist. Um, our mores, I don't know if that's the point, right? Our culture is, is that you respect confidentiality and that when people reveal things in confidence to you, you respect that confidence. Um, and I said, well, you know, I'm not going to publicly discuss what you just told me because that is for you to publicly discuss. But I thought I made it clear uh, that I didn't think he should proceed. And that was the last I heard from him until um, we got to Hong Kong and I got off a flight and walked into the <coughs> lobby and some of the other committee members were there and said, have you heard uh, what JK did? And I thought, well, I, maybe they've heard that he's planning on doing this. And I said, uh, no, what, what, what has he done? And um, he, they said, well, he's, you know, the, uh, there's YouTube videos and an MIT two press reports describing that he's claiming to have edited the embryos of, uh, edited two embryos at the CCR5 gene, uh, implanted them into the mom, and twins have been born. Um, and um, at that point, you know, it's like, well, clearly we have to figure out what to do about this. And um, so the committee met and decided to rearrange the schedule of the, of the meeting to accommodate this uh, Bancha, um, and uh, we pulled him out of the session that he was uh, supposed to speak in, gave him a full 20 minutes to, to present his, uh, I'm, I'm not even going to call it a study because I don't believe it was actually done in a scientifically justified manner, but what he had done, um, and then uh, followed up with a scheduled 20 minutes of Q&A, um, which went much longer. And uh, Robin Lavelle Badge, a leader in the field of human embryology research from the Crick in the UK, was one of the assigned moderators. And then I was asked to be a second moderator on the stage and had an opportunity to directly ask JK about what he had, what he had done and try to uh, get more details. Um, and it became clear both in his presentation and in uh, the Q&A that uh, as he answered questions, there was a degree of detail and transparency that was missing. Um, that he was saying certain things, but he was not saying other things. Um, and at that point, I realized, uh, in, including to a question that I had about um, you know, how many couples, how many embryos, how many implanted, so on and so forth. Um, and so then other questions were asked, and, and then I realized that, and he said, well, the study, the study, as he calls it, this clinical trial was stopped, and he, um, proposed, and, and the two babies, I realized that there was a gap, because there's a nine-month gap between the study proposed and babies being born. And so then I uh, said, you know, JK, are there any other pregnancies? And he said, um, he hemmed and hawed for a couple seconds, looked at Robin, who I think he had already told this to, and said, yes, there's one other pregnancy early, early on, um, and that's how it left it. Um, so obviously gas from the audience. And then the second question that I think for me was quite revealing is I, I am an MD and I have consented people to go on clinical trials. And as I said, we're developing clinical trials for CRISPR editing. And I know how in the US, how a consent form is reviewed by hundreds of people. And I knew JK was a biophysicist and I knew um, that he had no training in this. So I said, who wrote the consent form? How many people reviewed the consent form before you ever shared it with a patient? And he said, four, four people. Um, and again, all the sociologists in the audience gasped because of course that is just, couldn't, couldn't imagine doing it <coughs> less. Um, so after that, um, um, he, you know, there was a few more questions he left and I haven't had, uh, I had a couple email exchanges with him early on about uh, whether his manuscript should be published. Um, I considered uh, facilitating it, getting published in some journal or posting in some public place. But at, at, uh, I, I sort of then came to the realization that since I believe that this was unethical research, 
done in an unethical way, that I did not want to facilitate the formal posting of research that I did not believe um, uh, deserved to get that degree of formal recognition. And so I stopped uh, interacting with them and had no further interactions with them since. And um, I'm going to stop there because I've talked long enough. Like a law professor, I should have switched degrees and 50 maybe. Minutes. Minutes. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway. So, but I'm happy to talk about some of the other issues as we go along. Well, thank you, Matt. That's, a, that's a, a good platform for going forward here. I want to tell you a little bit about, extend a little bit what Matt said about the gene editing summit itself. I, too, arrived the night before, got to the hotel lobby, and it was buzzing. I had just taken it down from the internet on the end of my flight, so I knew about it. Actually, I was called by the reporter when I was in the San Francisco airport to talk about the story that he broke this news through. It was a leaked document. It was not an official planned bombshell, as, as Matt has said. But it, in effect, it was an amazing moment because the, the International Summit had been convened for the orderly discussion and consideration of where we were going collectively and this was completely outside the normal expectations. It was, it was disruptive, and it was also a, a somewhat of an embarrassment for the scientific community, because it basically said, for all the efforts to self-regulate, we have failed, uh, at least in this instance. So as Matt implied or said overtly, the, the news took over all the discussions around the conference dominated anyway. And JK was scheduled um, for a panel discussion, but they broke out a session for him. And I can tell you, the moment he walked onto stage uh, on the second day of the conference was one of the most remarkable events I've seen in my lifetime. He, he came out. There were security guards. He was being threatened from outside sources and forces. And he walked onto the stage with his briefcase. He was upright. He was seemed calm. He, the auditorium, which held maybe 800 or 1,000 people, had been divided. And one third of it was dedicated to the press. And there had been 36 hours since the announcement. They'd flown in from all over the world. There were cameras you know, that were as long as a car. And, and um, there was absolute silence in the auditorium as he came in. It was sort of like the world had ended. And then as soon as he got into the photogenic position at the podium, the clicks started. And it was so loud that the moderator had to step forward and say, no more pictures. And then as he spoke, he was calm. He was seemed fairly confident. And yet there was troubling kind of vagueness in his presentation. And then as he sat down and received questions, he was stumbled up several times. Well, to back up from this moment, I was watching this fellow because I had, as Matt said, I, I had been co-organizer with Jennifer Doudna of a project, I am co-organizer of a project with Jennifer on, on uh, the social and ethical issues associated with with gene editing. Jennifer Doudna, together with Emmanuel Charpentier, a French scientist, is a co-discoverer of a revolutionary new technology, CRISPR-Cas9. And the reason why this moment at the gene editing summit was so dramatic was because the entire audience knew what it meant, in the sense that these were the most well-informed and intensely interested people probably in the whole world who recognize the, the truly dramatic moment we are at in the process of, of science and technology. This new discovery of CRISPR-Cas9 is builds on 50 years of technology and discussion of gene editing. When I was a Stanford medical student, it started to unfold. And so many people have been thinking about this. But up until now, it was expensive, it was very time consuming, and it was not as 
precise as was desired. Suddenly, with the discovery of CRISPR-Cas9, which was Science Magazine's breakthrough of the year in 2015, um, was announced a couple of years before, but it took time. By that time, there had been literally thousands of, of uh, science publications using this new technology. And just to put it in perspective for you, Rudolf Janisch, who did the first, made the first transgenic mouse, told me that it took him 30 years ago, two years, $200,000, and he could change a single gene. Today, he said, in three weeks, that's the gestation time of a mouse, he can produce this, a, a transgenic mouse not for the same price, time, or precision. He can do it in three weeks for a couple hundred dollars, and he can change six or eight genes at the same time if he wants to. This is an absolute revolution in biotechnology. It signals the beginning of a truly remarkable potential for interventions in human life with really fantastic possibilities. What Matt has been talking about Somatic cell, that means after you're up and running as an organism, somatic cell interventions can potentially address the, well, what's the estimate now? Close to 10,000 single gene genetic diseases, 95% of which have no interventions whatsoever for either cure or treatment. And it's not an enormous number of people, but it's a significant number of people who are profoundly suffering. So it's a hopeful tool, but not just for medicine. It holds a potential for alterations at very fundamental levels of human need, for example, in agriculture and ecological balancing. Next five years from now, when you come for your lunch at the law school, you might get a CRISPR-edited lunch. Um, so it's, it's a remarkable moment. But because the power for intervention in human life is so dramatic, it raises very profound questions. Now, I just want to take a one more minute and tell you my background on this. Uh, as Hank mentioned, I, I'm, I'm a, I'm trained as a physician. My appointment's in the Department of Neurobiology. But I got involved in the international discussions on biotechnology, my service on the President's Council on, Council on Bioethics. When we organized this conf conference series and this project with Jennifer Dowden, JK was an invited guest. A few months later, he emailed me and said, I'm coming through Stanford. Could I talk with you? And so I invited him to lunch, and we sat out here behind the union and talked about his project. And fortunately, I didn't have much on my schedule that afternoon. And we talked for a long time, several hours, and subsequently, Three or four times more, he, called, he emailed me and we got together. One time I talked with him all afternoon. And just a side shot, one, one day I said, he was talking about nature being a strange combination of suffering and beauty and how there's mystery and profundity and the natural order of things. And we want to be very careful how we alter it. And I used, cited the beauty of a redwood tree that I live out behind campus. And I've got some redwood trees in my backyard. And and he, he didn't even know what a redwood tree really was. I said, you never saw a redwood tree and you were at Stanford for years, a postdoc? So I took him for a hike out in Hudart Park. If you've never been there, you got to go. And he just loved it. It was so amazing. But I realized here was a guy who was here in America for several years, one year at Stanford. He never went west of 280. He had very few friends. Nobody was talking with him much about what he was doing. And he hadn't thought about the larger social and political implications, the legal implications of what he was doing. So I, I took this on as a task and tried to help him see the perspectives. I had no idea he was implanting embryos because I was trying to slow him down, encourage him to stay in conversation with the larger community. At one point, I even talked to him and later sent to him the Gettysburg Address, saying that Society works best when it's of the people, by the people, for the people, within the context of wider discussion. So um, just one more thing, and that is that since the, the gene editing summit in Hong Kong at the end of November, uh, JK has continued to write emails to me and, and uh, several times, about once a week, 
I've had very long conversations with him on the telephone as recently as Monday night. Each time we've talked for several hours and I've learned more and more about this subject. And I guess the most important thing for me to say here is what Hank ended with, that this is about a lot more than one experiment and one personal story, which itself is fascinating for its social and cultural context, for the way it came to be. But the larger question here, and the most important question is, how are we going to, as a collective species, govern this powerful and potentially dangerous technology with a diversity of cultures and national interests, commercial, military, and medical? How are we going to do it? It's a very huge challenge. <coughs> I'll be fairly brief, as brief as I can be, which as a law professor may not be all that brief. Uh, I wasn't in Hong Kong. I just finished a nice dinner on Sunday evening, November 25th, went to the computer, got on Twitter for the first time in quite a few hours, and my <laughs> dinner didn't feel as good. I got some indigestion. I first saw the information about the article that broke the story by Antonio Regalado at MIT Technology Review. And then the AP story came out, and then there were links to some YouTube videos. And I realized this was going to be dis both disconcerting and very, very interesting. And I've, I've certainly proven to be both those things. I've never met JK. I don't know him, although I did watch the live stream of, the Hong Kong of his presentation at the Hong Kong Summit. And I was impressed at how calm and under control and even kind of likable he was, although as he got questioned, his answers, I, I was less impressed with his ability to answer some of the questions and the answers that he gave. I will say first, I have no trouble unequivocally condemning what he did for reasons that actually have very little to do with germline genome editing. I think it was a bad experiment. First, one of the very most fundamental issues about human subject research, doing research with human subjects, is that the potential benefits to the subject or to society must outweigh the potential risks to the subject. I think this failed that enormously because the risks to these embryos and the babies the embryos would become were not well fleshed out. We didn't have the years of work with non-human animals. We didn't have the years of work with human embryos in vitro. We didn't know what was going to happen and how much they were risking. And I don't want to overstress this point, but they didn't get consent. I'm 66, if I get a bad cancer and decide to do some wacky, you know, Matt has a clinical trial that's half insane, but he got through this cancer by RG somehow, and I agree to do it and it goes wrong, yeah, that's why it's a death, and at least I consented to it. The embryos didn't consent. Now, I don't want to take that too far because I don't remember signing a consent form to be born alone to be born to whom and where I am. I don't think we can say you can never do research that affects fetuses, embryos, children who can't consent. But I think it raises the stakes in terms of being confident about safety. It has to be even more safe when you're affecting people who didn't have a voice in the decision to go ahead and become these researchers. And the benefit here of them being maybe resistant to or even immune to HIV, perhaps, seem to be grossly out of touch with the, grossly out of sync with the risks. If this had been done for a really serious terrible disease, Tay-Sachs disease, for example, I still think it probably would have been a bad idea at this time, but at least it's in the ballpark. But to prevent a disease that is otherwise preventable and that they probably wouldn't be uh, at risk for for quite, for several decades anyway, seemed to me a very bad risk benefit. Second, I think there are real questions about the consent process. We don't know, and, and this is something important about all this. We have no independent verification as far as I know of really any of this. I think it happened. The fact that uh, Wong Wu Suk in South Korea pulled off a blatant fraud about cloning human embryos about 10 or 12 years ago reminds me that sometimes people will fraudulently claim things that seem insane to fraudulently claim because people will check up on them. I don't think that happened here. I think this happened, but we really don't know much of the way of the facts. We don't know much of the facts about the consent. What I've heard makes me very nervous about whether the parents involved 
really understood what was being done and did it presented in an appropriate way. And then the third point does have to do with particular technology involved. There's been enough discussion of using germline genome editing, editing that changes eggs and sperm, and so changes generate has the potential to change future generations. That it is clear that as close as science can ever get to a consensus on anything, the consensus is expressed by the National Academies, is expressed in the first summit, as expressed by even the uh, relatively uh, got even more criticism, the Nuffield Council report from the UK. Consensus is if you do, you got to be very, you have to discuss it a lot, you have to be open, you have to be transparent. It violated all that. I think this was a really bad idea. And my hope is the baby's going to be okay and grow up well. Um, but shouldn't have been done. In the long run, <coughs> should we do germline gene editing or not? It's, I think, an interesting and complicated question. I like the Valentine, what I call the Valentine's Day report. Uh, from the National Academies. I thought that was, and, and the, the Nuffield Council in 2018 put out a similar report. I think the criteria they put up were good, but I'd emphasize another one that shows up in some of the statements more broadly than others, social acceptance. And it has to be something that people are willing to let you do. Science does not exist independent of its culture and society. It cannot exist and it should try to. And I'm afraid, I was actually a little upset with your uh, organizing committee statement after yeah. the second summit because it didn't really emphasize that as much as I think it should have. So that then brings up an issue that Bill raised. There are a lot of countries, a lot of cultures, a lot of people. And what do you do if some cultures want to do it and some cultures don't? What, how do you deal globally with an issue where cultures are going to be different? And I think that's going to be a really interesting question. So I'm going to shut up for now. I'll ask you. Matt and Bill to come forward, we'll sit down, we'll talk a little amongst ourselves, perhaps, and then we'll take questions. I'll ask one of our fellows to move the uh, microphone around for questions from the audience. Bill, Matt, anything you want to say about what anybody else has said? Um, I'd, I'd like to add two things. One, is that today, the New England Journal of Medicine is probably not a journal that most of you read regularly, but today's issue came out with three commentaries and perspectives on this issue, one yeah. written by Alta Chara. So, um, if you're interested, I recommend reading those. Alton Char, a great law professor and another member of the organization. That's right. Um, and the co chair of the committee that did the Valentine's Day report. That's right. But um, she tells me that Valentine's Day was a coincidence. Um, but there are several reports, and, and, and she's also been a long time engaged in this ethics around so these are, I would say that I don't agree with everything that was written in all three, but they're nice, three nice articles. Um, second thing that goes to Hank and, and Bill's point more broadly, because I've heard people critique what JK did on technical grounds. He didn't know it was safe. And I have a problem with that because it might be safe, and in one day it will be technically safe. And so I think when we make the argument that this shouldn't be done for technical reasons, we are actually not facing head on what are the really more important reasons. Is if it was technically possible, should we tech, should we do this? And and really, that's to me the focus. So don't hide behind technical arguments. So that's interesting. There's going to be a disciplinary difference. Um, yeah. I don't think of it as hiding behind him. I'm saying this is necessary but not sufficient. Even yes. if you, even if you reach the necessary, but if it's not if the necessary things aren't done, you don't have to reach the further question. And one thing the U.S. Supreme Court and other courts often will do is not reach constitutional questions if they can resolve a case on a statutory basis. If, you, if you've got a, a lower level, easier way to resolve a case, you don't resolve it on the highest level unless you have to. Yeah. That's a convention in U.S. courts. It's Interesting. not a law of okay. nature. Yeah. Bill? Well, to build on what, what Matt just said, there are many issues beyond safety involved here. It's just, just think of what by the ability to alter the genetics of children. Let's just keep to that issue. There are many issues social genetics. So that if we're just talking about germline editing, there are many questions associated with the ability to do that. The nightmare scenarios that the journalists are very good at highlighting are issues like desire babies and state-run eugenics programs. And whereas I don't think those 
go out to be considered seriously and, and debated and deliberated, they are not very realistic. Uh, for one thing, genes are not like Legos. You don't just, it's not like Mr. Potato Head where you just put on a new nose or new ear. Most of the things we really care about significantly are matters such as, as beauty, longevity, intelligence, being able to get into Stanford, and stuff like that. And that, there's no gene for being able to get into Stanford. It's, it's, those are traits in human nature that are controlled by hundreds, perhaps thousands, by some rights, all genes combined in effects on each other. And, and there's certain reasonableness for that, that consideration. So, Maybe those are unrealistic scenarios, but in the in the middle ground are profound questions about what constitutes a disease in the first place. Just to give you some sense of this, in the in the textbooks of the antebellum South, there was a disease called Drake which comes from the Greek words meaning a, a passion or tendency to run away. And the the treatment was whipping. You get the point. Slaves who ran away were considered uh, subject to a pathology. And of course, in our, our society, there are a lot of blind spots about what constitutes a definable disease. Is dyslexia a disease? 10, maybe 15% of the population has dyslexia. You might think it amounts to a different shape of mind. But people with dyslexia are struggling through the center. And what about albinism? Is, is that a disease? Well, probably it's reasonable to consider that a disorder, but it's super compatible with, with life. So Matt can expand on this, but there are profound questions. Do we really want to slip slowly into the notion of designing our children, filtering and selecting and altering them? Do we want, to want the process of procreation to become production? Um, do we want societies to take charge and how will this change our personal and social relations and our sense of self? Well, with this question, we've got about a half hour to take your questions. I'm going to engage, though, in a sentence of shameless self-promotion. Lots of the questions Bill talked about, I explored, I would not say answered, but at least raised in a book published in 2016 called The End of Sex and the Future of Human Reproduction, focused mainly on embryo selection rather than embryo editing. Questions? Don't be shy. <coughs> yeah, you did, so we want you to, did you turn the microphone off? We want you to use the microphone so that Alpha Tori will hear your words in 4.3 years. Hank, you raised a, a very broad question about what can be done on embryos, what can be done before their embryos, what can be done newborns, where there is no consent by the individual who will or is involved. What is the law on that, and is it consistent throughout the world, or is it vary? So I'm, I'm confident, I think that the only thing I can confidently say is there's no law I know of that's consistent around the world. <laughs> um, but in general, parents, guardians do have the power to make medical decisions, to volunteer children, embryos, fetuses, eggs, and sperm, for medical research. Um, I don't know that the law, well, there is a special section of the common rule which covers human subject research in the United States dealing with research with children. So there are special protections you have to go through with children. The FDA has even more complicated special provisions for children. So I think we, we cranked up the scrutiny a little bit. Um, but we do allow it to happen. Because otherwise, you know, if you're looking for a disease that kills people by the age of one and you require their consent, then that would be able to do it. Maybe a specific example of how, how these issues um, uh, UK and US are very different. So there's this concept of savior siblings. So if a, one child has a genetic disease that can be rescued by a home or a transplant from a sibling. There are now centers, multiple centers around the country and around the world, which will allow the mom and dad to generate embryos, screen the embryos for the ones that will be the best match to the child who's alive and doesn't have the disease, and then 
selected or they plan um, that idea. I don't even think that was a consensual process because it's not an idea of clinic. So you're the you're probably not. I have an idea of clinic, clinician here, but I'm sure it's consensual to some extent. But, but it's probably not viewed as research, it's probably viewed as clinical practice. And, and obviously that embryo had no, so we clearly allowed embryo selection without embryo consent. So right. there's a precedent in the US. Now, UK has a different model. You couldn't do that without approval from a national authority. Yeah. And the first Savior Civ case I know of actually happened in Chicago because the UK refused permission. Right. Let me comment on that. There's a famous case, one of the early cases, that of embryos didn't have a problem match. So they went on to another and another, and I think they went through something like 150 embryos <laughs> before they found suitable donor and discarded the rest. So it creates a submission system. Yeah, and yeah. one of our Stanford faculty colleagues has, spoke, has spoken in our lunch series, Gordon Chang, he and his wife um, received a savior sim. They actually had only one embryo. Ordinarily, unfortunate that the embryo was a good enough match and the embryo took, and now they have two healthy daughters instead of having one very ill daughter. But all, one of the reasons I love what I do, all of these technologies are spinning out so many questions in so many different areas, and they're all fascinating. But you guys have had some fascinating thoughts. Um, as far as any of you are aware, have major academic publishing houses taken a unified stance on the publication of any or all of JK's data? Maybe I'll start with a general question. And maybe some, um, he, he, he submitted it. I don't know where we have. I mean, he I can guess at what journals he submitted to me. It was not true. Um, but the journal, every respectable journal, does sign by an agreement. So I think that's the challenge in him never getting this published is because he wouldn't pass muster for what the criteria is for getting this published. So all major journals have that caveat. Um, how do you define what ethical or not needs to be seen? Um, uh, I was, uh, Dave Rowan is another really interesting guy in the Stanford community, was describing a, an issue where the New England Journal of Medicine, again, the premier clinical research journal in our country, published uh, a paper in authors uh, analyzed data that was uh, derived from Nazi studies of Jews. Um, and they were roundly criticized for publishing data that was achieved in an unethical manner, even though the Such researchers Jews in concentration. Yes, that's the Jews before them. they were killed. That's right. Um, even though the researchers themselves were just mining pre existing data, they were critiqued for that. So um, it probably won't be published. But I suspect it will probably get out somewhere. I hope it does. Yeah, but that is, that it, there's the tension. There's been the discussion for decades about the Nazi experiments and whether and to what extent it's ethical to make use of data that was achieved unethically, but that you'll never, because of the ethical, yeah. you'll never see it any other way. Uh, and I don't know that there's a, arguments, arguments continue. Regarding the uh, Nazi experiments or death. You all, every one of you, are reading an article called Medicine Under Dictatorship by Leo Alexander, who wrote the Nuremberg Code. It's good when you're, don't do it just before you go to bed, you're going to have nightmares. It's very, very disturbing. And um, he had a very, the article was a very trenchant and disturbing paragraph where he talks about how. The whole thing, this is mostly describing what Mengele did in natural. The whole thing he said began culturally with the very tiniest assumptions that there was such a thing as a life not with him, and slowly slipped along into a very utilitarian and barbaric uh, practice. Um, definitely read that article. With regard to the publication of JK's work, uh, I no more than I can actually tell you, but I can tell you that he's very eager to have it published, and that there are serious journals, serious journals, 
considering it at this point. And, and, uh, but I think if it was published, it was likely to be published in the context, and I, I favor this, by the way. It's too widely known now to, to keep it hidden <coughs> out of the news. It's great now to examine what happens so you can learn something from it. So I'm hoping it will get published in the context of considerable comment about the science and the social culture in which it emerged. Yeah. One, so one, one, one more specific thing I really forgot to mention. Journals, and again, all the major reputed journals, have a policy that if you don't post your clinical trial on clinicaltrials.gov in the U.S., then they won't publish it. And that's one of the ways of sort of regulating what they'll publish, because they don't want people coming to post hoc and saying, look at what we did. Um, so that, that is uh, also in place. Uh, Interestingly, so yeah. the guy who wrote the story, and I think I read a lot of it, looked at the Chinese version yeah. of clinical trials by and that's where he found out. Yeah. Because this trial was registered there. Like the day of. Right, very, very briefly. Um, there's so many aspects of this story that are fascinating. Although, I don't know when he was, maybe one of you, I don't know when he was planning to disclose this. He had been in communication with the Associated Press for quite a while before the summit. He had made some YouTube videos before the summit. Clearly, something was going to happen soon. And so, Greg Alata's group pushed the process forward. So, we've got a couple questions over there. Do you have any questions for those behind the slides? Or the one in black? <laughs> um, so, I have a two part question. So it seems like in 2015 there was similar outrage when a Chinese scientist did the first editing whatsoever on abnormal human embryos. Um, but you reference now that it seems like the moratorium is more functional. There's 10 criteria that functionally define when we'll be ready to do it. And it seems also that the U.S. National Academy has given some, though limited, support, at least on their website, to gene editing in abnormal human embryos. So it seems like we've already opened the Pandora's box on the pure ethics issue of whether we should be doing embryos at all, since doing it on abnormal embryos in the pretense of never reaching application is probably, you know, we're probably doing it on the pretense of eventual human application. So the first part is what's changed since the first ed editing that has made editing on abnormal human embryos more okay, if it's not just a pure technical issue of when we'll be able to do it. And secondly, I would be interested in, to know, in knowing what these 10 functional criteria are, if you have a chance. Normal is that they weren't going to be transferred into a uterus for possible implantation of birth. Sorry, the first ones were actually abnormal. They were tracked by. But I, I know, but it, but it wasn't important. But that was yeah. an issue, but I think the deeper issue was yeah. they, were, they were ex vivo, in vitro research, not to be used to try to make a baby. Um, the very first ones were abnormal, that people did use some embryo editing in normal ones, but no one, as far as we know, until JK. Took embryo, uh, edited embryos and transferred them into a uterus for possible uh, birth. That's, I think, the, the distinction between the earlier work. The first work was controversial, but not nearly as controversial as this. And I think it's the difference between um, an, uh, an embryo in a dish that will never become a baby and an actual babies. Not everyone, different people view that distinction differently. Some people think that's a huge difference, some people think that's less huge difference, but uh, everybody sees it differently. Almost everybody sees a difference between those two. In terms of the principles, I don't know, Matt, it looks like you've been pulling them up. Uh, I do recommend, I think it's an excellent report. I agree with most of it. If you agree with all of it, you'll be in trouble, right? Yeah. You'll be pissed at that. Um, but Matt, do you have them handy? I do. Um, I will also say there's a difference, again, going back to what's come up, there's a difference in jurisdictions. In the US, Human embryo editing is not allowed using any federal funds. Um, you can only do that with private funds. And there was, uh, we thought the most controversial talk at the summit was going to be actually a presentation from the researchers at uh, Oregon Health Sciences on their work that was published in Nature. Um, how wrong we were. Whereas in the UK, they have the HFEA, um, which has approved doing human embryo research. In Jurisdictions have different regulatory. In vitro work in the United States is legal, but they can't do it with federal funds. That's right. Um, so here are the ten. And, uh, uh, and we should have these don't have the force of law. No, they're, 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 they're the official positions of the National Academy of Sciences and the National Academy of Medicine of the United States. They carry and should carry significant weight, but they're not binding. So absolutely. 
absence of reasonable alternatives, restrictions preventing a serious disease or condition. Sorry. Uh, well, yeah, the microphone is behind us. It should be close enough to get it for uh, recording, Sorry. but. So. Uh, Actually, the bed mic may only be for the recording. Talk yeah. about. I'll just talk about. Okay, absence of reasonable alternatives, which is uh, in subtext was IVF with PGD. Restriction to preventing a serious disease or condition. Restriction to editing genes that have been convincingly demonstrated to cause or to strongly to predispose to a serious disease or condition. Restriction to converting such genes to versions that are prevalent in the population are known to be associated with ordinary health with little or no adverse events. That is the one that people have missed, mostly. It is almost impossible to do that. Um, to take a sequence, uh, well, I will, I'll, I'll stop editorializing. Uh, if, <laughs> That's what you're trying to do, uh, yeah, to warn people. Yeah, but we are actually not, well, we can talk about it. Availability of credible preclinical and or clinical data on risks and potential health benefits of the procedure. Ongoing rigorous oversight during clinical trials of the effects of the procedure on the health and safety of the research participants. Comprehensive plans for long-term multi-generational follow-up while still respecting personal autonomy. Maximum transparency consistent with patient privacy. Continued reassessment of both health and societal benefits and risk with broad and ongoing participation and input by the public and then reliable oversight mechanisms to prevent extension to uses other than preventing a serious disease or condition. Uh, I don't think JK satisfied any one of those, but. You can download the whole report in yeah. the PDF for free. Excellent okay. candidate is a wonderful resource. Let me say something about the law. I mean, these are not law, but there are laws in a variety of countries. Somewhere, depending on how you count, 30, 40, 50 countries expressly banned. Much of Europe, a few countries elsewhere. Um, the UK is one of those countries. Uh, there are bans that are in statutes. The statutes can be changed. The United States does not have a statute saying it is illegal. But the Food and Drug Administration, in decisions dating back to Dolly, the, the aftermath of Dolly the Sheep, has taken the position that genetically altered human embryos that have been more than minimally modified uh, cells are either drugs or biological products that have to be approved by FDA. Uh, it was a warning with respect to cloning. It was then a warning letter that stopped work on mitochondrial transfer in the early 2000s in the United States. If that's true, and I think the FDA has a decent, has probably a good legal argument, but there are a lot of judges in this world. I'm not sure if it's not a slam dunk legal argument, if there is such a thing. Uh, then you need FDA permission. FDA permission to do it clinically requires a new drug application or biological license application, years and years of research, hundreds of millions of dollars, big deal. To do it for research purposes, you require an investigational new drug exemption for which you apply to FDA and say, here's the, the pre-human work that makes us think this is, you know, probably safe-ish, and there's some good reason to do it. If FDA doesn't block it within 30 days, then you can do it. FDA, no way, not going, FDA would certainly have blocked any such thing, but Congress took steps to make that irrelevant. In December 2015, Congress passed a, an amendment to the appropriations for FDA, saying first, nobody could be used to study any of this, but, but even more cleverly, note with the IND, if the FDA doesn't block it, it has a new effect. They said, no application to do human heritable genetic modifications. To do heretic, heritable genetic modifications in humans will be, can be received or deemed received by FDA. So it goes into effect 30 days after it's received. But by congressional statute, it can't be received. You can get the entire Supreme Court to swear that they saw this handed in to the receptionist at FDA. But legally, it's not received. That's Appropriation rider, appropriations bills, the theory lasts a year. A third of the government doesn't have one right now, so theory and practice could be a little hard to sink. Has to be renewed every year. It has been every year so far. 
there's one involving the one that the man referred to about harming embryos with federal funding. It uh, goes back to 1995 and has been renewed every year since 1995. So it's functionally, complicatedly illegal in the United States. It's more straightforwardly illegal in another 30 or 40 countries. There are a bunch where it's questionable. Some people in the Chinese government have said that it's illegal in China because it violates the regulations saying all human research should be ethical and moral. That's probably not an argument that would work in an American court because of the vagueness of it, but different legal cultures, different cultures have different legal cultures. And I don't have a, if Beijing decides that it's illegal, I think there's a very good chance that it's illegal. So that's the legal stance. Can I speak to yeah, the issue of the mail? I think the question that was raised here is a very important and profound question. Because as as Ken says the moment of the national uh, the international summit was, and it was really I I described it a little, it was like I felt anyway as though I was at the very epicenter of the human story, at least that each chapter of it. It was everybody there knew to me. Something had happened. The door had been opened. We turned the corner. It was a kind of hinge of history. Now we were thinking about altering the human genome, affecting our own evolutionary process, at least in many lineages. But if you really stop back, look at the practical, step back and look at the practical implications of it. I, as I said earlier, I, I don't think they're going to be quite as dramatic as some people think. It's going to be many, many decades before we're effectively and I often, when I speak, I get questions, well, won't the rich be able to buy better genomes, and won't the poor be a subclass, and won't we divide it into species? And at least for the foreseeable future, my opinion on that is that it will be the children of the poor that will be the lucky ones, because they won't get experimented on. But there is another issue here that was raised by the question, and it's a profound question. What's happened is, Turn the, turn the century, we move from the era of molecular biology to the era of developmental biology. We now have this human genome sequence. We do the raw ingredients which knit together to form the living human organism. That means that studies that were done in the dish will now take place in living human form. We're going to study human beings. A lot of them will be done in mice and so forth. But that raises the issue not just of embryos and clinical work, but embryos and experimentation. If you back up about 20 years from right now, that issue came up in the embryonic stem cell debate. And I sat on the President's Council during that time, and I can tell you it was very tense. The country was, before 9-11, that was the most significant issue facing the public. President Bush made his first public address to the nation on August 9th, 2001, and it was about embryonic stem cell research. The whole question was whether or not this research, which was very hopeful, and I always believed it was very hopeful, was moral. Both sides had important, we were defending important principles. On the one hand, the advances of science and medicine. On the other hand, the intrinsic dignity of the human being from the origins of a living human organism. And so that was about what would be done with TB discarded IVF embryos and perhaps created uh, cloned embryos. But now, look at what the issue really is. The issue is now, will we use human embryos instrumentally to study developmental biology to promote advances in our understanding of biomedicine? And it's a whole other arena, and I think it's going to make the debates over embryonic stem cell research in my mere phrases. The, the issue I think is the political arena very strong in that, but it's going to eventually. Yeah, so what is the um the status of the baby's genotypes? I know there was issues of mosaicism and from there you could draw efficacy. Um, I think Hank made a I'll speak up, sorry. I think Hank made an excellent point that um, I also believe that this is unlikely to be brought um, given his all the data he's presented, but it has not been independently validated, and I think we don't know what the degree of mosaicism is in these two children. Um, what he has presented is, is, is if, as if there is no mosaicism. Um, I find that technically unlikely, um, and I think that's why uh, we need an independent investigation to get at the 
scientific to tell us what, what is done. I think it's unfortunate right now that the Chinese authorities who are investigating this have not been more transparent about their timeline of the investigation and what they intend on doing. I think they are doing uh, the world writ large a disservice by this lack of transparency. I think they're doing themselves a disservice by being not having transparency uh, about how they're investigating this. Um, and I think that's leading to a lot of speculation and potentially, you know, it, it never is deemed to be a transparent and understandable investigation. It could lead to a lot of conspiracy theories. I mean, the human nature, we like to go there. Um, and I really hope uh, that they, they, they change their mind on this. You know, there are tensions in all of this. I'd really love to see those two trips carefully studied. Also, little babies, and do they have privacy rights that need to be respected? So the world wants to know what are what, what are their rights. Louise Brown, the first IVF baby, was very famous as she became an adult and a teenager. She sort of withdrew from public scrutiny. Her 40th birthday was last year, and so she's kind of re-entered the public arena after that. Um, you, you have to spare some, some thought and sympathy for what it would be like to be grow up with everybody knowing the first CRISPR baby, the first two CRISPR babies. So, and again, it's mentioned about the consent form. Um, and it's available, although it's more difficult to be available at this point online. There's a couple really huge uh, red flags. One is it's called an HIV vaccine. And the last page says that the parents agree to them and their children photographed and those photographs to be disseminated to the media. Um, that would never, I mean, that, so this issue of privacy is sort of, it's real, and yet written to the consent is as you're agreeing not to be private. Um, that, again, that would never pass muster in any IRB, FDA, consent form, in Europe or the US. So many of the by the hospitals whose IRB issued it, that they never did this, that just must have been for you. I have no idea whether that's true or not, but neither does anybody else outside the investigation, and we have no idea what the investigation is. I think we have time for maybe two more questions that we can get answers quickly. Being, being professors, all right, we can get all of them. Let's take Claire. poor families because they'll be safe from gene editing because much of medical and biomedical experimentation and surgical exploration was done on the backs and bodies of the poor with limited benefit to them in that moment or in the long run. So I think we have to be very, very careful when we talk about that. We've already seen that because PGD and IVF are unregulated in the United States, there are levels of access and disparities there that we cannot yet explain away or uh, even out in, on the social playing field. Um, so in both of your stories, as you talked about the conference and your role and your experiences at the conference and in speaking with uh, JK, you've distanced yourself, right? The places where you disagree with it, the places where you saw error, the places where you saw fault and the challenges of it, and I understand that. I understand the outrage. I don't understand the surprise. And the reason I don't understand the surprise is because genetic technologies have pushed boundaries and pushed boundaries and pushed boundaries. Things that were developed for one purpose are being rolled out for others. Microarray testing, initially for pediatric and adult conditions, now being used in the prenatal period. PGD, initially developed to prevent childhood onset debilitating fatal disorders, now being used for things like BRCA, which is adult onset preventable. Lives, I believe, in my own work, worth living. So I understand the outrage that this has been done, but the academy is predicated on success in the academy internationally is predicated on making groundbreaking discoveries. And we've now had a first. So I under and I think this international regulation, while completely necessary, pushes activities like this underground in ways that again cannot be monitored and almost reinforces and nurtures these kinds of discoveries that then come onto the stage and we are outraged by. So I understand the distance, but I don't understand the surprise. And I guess it's a statement more than a question, but that's uh, where I'm sitting. But I think that uh, all those things you raised are important issues that will continue to be discussed. Right there. Uh, I just did. You know, it's not 
Use is not inevitable. It happens a lot, but it doesn't necessarily happen. One of the things I found really surprising, and maybe tomorrow's headlines will just prove this, with Dolly, there was immediate drop to hysteria about armies of clone warrior slaves. And it turned out that it very, it's going to be very hard to clone human embryos. But in 2013, Shukra um, Hawk, the state of Oregon, state health, Oregon, the Oregon Medical School, yeah. uh, clone human embryos. It's been widely replicated. People can do it. The aliens haven't done it. Dr. C hasn't done it. All the, all the people who were eager to do it 15 years ago, 20 years ago, haven't done it. I think sometimes lines hold, sometimes they don't. And I frankly was surprised that this one was So I'll keep it really short, and um, since I'm not a lawyer, I'll ask a question that I don't know the answer to. Um, you, <laughs> you particularly said you had problems with the closing statement that the organizing committee put out. So do I, but I would really like to know what your problems are and what the, rea what the reaction of the other two is. Thinking about the conditions that need to be met before this could be appropriately tried, one of which is public acceptance, legality, agreement. The consensus is probably too strong. Also, Charo walked back from some earlier language about global consensus, I think quite accurately, because the globe can't agree on anything, including whether it's a globe or whether it's flat. Uh, so I was, especially at the time, events have taken place that lead people to say you can't trust those scientists, they're always going to push too far. To not have to have some of the scientific bodies not say, but of course we can only consider this if it's publicly approved. I thought it was interesting. Um, the, the official summary didn't say that enough. Quotes from one of, the, one of your colleagues yeah. I thought were unfortunate. Yeah. Uh, I think they believe it, but I think they need it especially now. That, that was my nice time. So we've come to the end of our time. Um, we'll probably be kicked out soon for a Wall Street class anyway. I want to thank all of you for coming in. I want you to join me in thanking Bill and Matt.